Mm. Father, we thank you that your word is truth. It's real. It's powerful. We thank you, God, that even reading your word, when we don't understand what it says, it's somehow getting into our lives and getting into our hearts and discerning our thoughts and, and ideas and the very words that we speak, we find conviction in your word. God, please send your spirit upon us. We invite you to do whatever work you want to do, not what we want, but what you want, God. May we see our lives in relation to your word tonight. May we, may we see our lives and change to exactly what you want. As your word declares, from glory to glory, Precept upon precept. Uh, as I read this morning in my devotions, my God, you said, when your spirit said, seek my face, I said, your face I will seek. Be with us tonight as we seek your face. Amen. Amen. Last week, the last few weeks, we've watched the descent of Saul. Saul, a man who started in innocence, a man who started with such a humility. He was anointed king, and he forged an army in, in a matter of a couple of years. He took a nation of slaves, a nation of nomads, a nation of outcasts, fragmented, shattered, destroyed even, and he made an army out of them, an army that would conquer the Middle East, an army that would, with the power, with the very hand of God, restore, and renew, rejuvenate, relive, remind these people who their God was. So much like us, we, we, we can travel and wander for so many years in the street, in the wilderness, as the Bible says, and yet here we are, Christians, and our God is God. And He lives inside of us. And, and the power that raised Christ from the dead that lives in us. And there we are, walking around drinking a beer, smoking a joint, in misery in our relationships. And somebody every once in a while reminds you, walks over and get up. What? You're a Christian. What are you doing? Oh, I tried that Christianity that don't work. Yes, it works. But you've got to believe. You've got to step out in faith. You can't sit around waiting for it. Come on. All of a sudden, you throw the joint down. You put the beer down. You give God the test of faith. And you realize, I can't believe I've wasted so much time when this power lives in me. Unfortunately for Saul, the more God did in his life, the more monuments he built for himself. The more God showed up, so much like us, so much like us. We start small, we start young, we start hungry, and God does amazing things with us. He brings us good things, and then at some point in time we think, well, it was me that did it. You know, things happened by chance. It was just dumb luck. You know what I'm saying? And unfortunately for Saul, in the last chapter, God had enough of him. And God took his spirit from him and told Samuel, if you've been with us, told Samuel that he was going to do something great with him. He wanted him to, well, hold that thought. Chapter 16, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. Please, again, give me your attention. The word of God comes to Samuel. I often wondered in the Old Testament how that works. Did, God didn't appear to him. He couldn't have because the scripture doesn't say that. As a matter of fact, the scripture says if God appears to somebody, God's so holy they would die. But somehow this voice appears 
to Samuel and, and tells him all these instructions. Now, a lot of people read this and go, see, that's why I don't get the Bible, the whole God speaking to me thing. I don't understand how that works. Well, let me tell you something. When I was where you are, I didn't understand it either. But something happened about 16 years ago. There I was at Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale, and I was setting up the chairs in, in one of the rooms, and they decided they were going to have a prayer meeting in that room. And there was a guy named Wally Waiters. And there was a little glass window there, and I was walking by Wally. And if you don't, guys don't remember, Wally's a big, heavy set black dude. And he sang in the band. And he, I walked by the window, and he went, he knocked on the window, and he goes, Come here. And I went, What? Come here. So I was like, I walk in the room thinking, I hope the guy messed up all my chairs. You know, I just set the chairs up in that room. So I walk in, and he goes, We're having a prayer meeting. You want to pray with us? And I said, Sure, okay. You know, sounds like a good idea. I, I like to pray. I mean, I've heard a lot about prayer. Why not pray? So I went in, I sat down, and they had a prayer meeting, and the Holy Spirit moved upon me in ways that I didn't know He could, that I had no idea. I sensed something supernatural in God that there's something to this prayer, more than I understood. Well, fast track 10 years later, I've been involved not just in prayer meetings of the intercessory kind, but me and my wife now are part of the prayer meetings at church now at that point in time for over seven years. You learn a lot about the movement of the Holy Spirit, how to hear God's voice, how to sense the power. You guys, you ladies that are going through uh, the book of Living Water, uh, you're going to see that the Holy Spirit can give you a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. He can give you an unction. He can give you a gift. He can give you the speaking in tongues. All these things happen from experiencing the Holy Spirit. Now, some people will, oh, I want the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to give those. You pray? I pray every day. Tell me about your prayer life. Well, I pray every time I'm in the shower. I spend, that's my prayer time. And when I'm on my way, no, 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 no. Do you take time apart? Do you set time apart? Do you go into the closet, as the Bible calls it, and just ask God? I was talking to men last night, and there's a section of Scripture when the Lord Jesus was choosing his apostles that he went out in the wilderness. I'm sorry. He went out and woke up early in the morning, and he prayed all night long seeking answers. All night. And I thought to myself, I've never prayed all night long. I mean, I've prayed for a couple of hours, but it's like prayer is so easy. All I got to do is go, dear God, and now I'm praying, and God's hearing me. I don't have to go on a mountain. I don't have to go in a ditch. I could just pray anywhere. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that God already knows what I need before I've even asked, so why do I have to really pray? But there the Lord was, and he certainly had a closer relationship than I did with God, and he spent all night in prayer seeking his father. He had, you ready? A reverence for God. He had a reverence. He knew that even the smallest of prayer time, he was in the presence of God Almighty. And he didn't take it lightly. He didn't take it. And he knew, man, I've got a big decision to make and I'm going to spend all night in prayer. And there was never another man as filled with the Holy Spirit. There was never another man as wise as God. There was never another man as wise as the Lord Jesus. But he found it important enough to spend all night in prayer, sensing the movement of the Holy Spirit, not wanting to be distracted. Just a, a peek into the spiritual realm. If we could, if God would somehow peel away some of the layers of of the spiritual realm, and we've seen what was going on here. There's a devil sitting over somebody's head. There's an angel sitting over another. And they're sitting there whispering and, and throwing darts. There's so much going on, more than we see. I believe this. And the power of prayer fills you with a covering, fills you with a shield. The power of fasting strengthens you to hear God's voice. And God's saying to some of you, come on out. Let's start a business together. We can do it. You can bring glory to my name. It'll bless your family. And the enemy's like, no, if you quit your job, you're going to run out of money. You'll have no money. Your, your family's going to starve. Oh, man. And most people, sadly, because they don't take the time to pray, to fast, to seek God, as Samuel sought God his whole life, they can't hear the Holy Spirit. 
and they think they're stuck. So what's the, what's the point? Listen, there's no shortcut here, guys. I'm sorry. It's like going to the gym. You guys might see Kelly when he comes here. He's like walking thing. You think that came? Think it came in a bottle? <laughs> oh, maybe it did. No, it came from years and years and years of hard work. This young man has been training for 20 years since he's a baby, wrestling, fighting, weight training, running. The kid is in premium, top athlete, as good athlete that exists. Same situation. You want to hear the voice of God as clearly? Do you read this and are you confused when I say Samuel said this, Samuel said that, God said to Samuel this, and you go, see, that's why. Wait a second. Have you tried? Have you given God a chance? Have you ever fasted? Ready? Have you ever decided not to eat food but just drink water for three days? Some of you guys are like, you're out of your mind, Jack. Do you know how good food is? Uh, yeah. I really like food. I really like food. But I really like God more. And I really want to know God's plan for my life, even now. I'm not finished. I don't know what the next season of mine and my wife's life holds. More kids, less kids, who, who knows? Moving, staying, you know, what are we going to do? I don't know what God's plan is. Well, you're a pastor of a church. You can't go nowhere. God tells me to go anywhere. I'm gone. Bye. I ain't going to sit around, but I'm certainly not going to go. Well, God told me to move to Las Vegas, so I'm going to Las Vegas. Well, God told me I should, you know, uh, abandon my church, leave my wife and kids, and become a missionary in Africa. No, he didn't. How do you know he didn't? Because God's never going to tell you to leave your wife and kids behind. Oh, how do you know that? Scripture, counsel, wisdom. I think you got the point. God says to Samuel, I've rejected Saul. You need to cut the nonsense. I know you love him. I know he's been a big part of your life, but I've rejected him. I've chosen the king I want to choose. Now, let me tell you, for you Bible scholars here, there's something incredible going on here. If you were a student of Scripture, when Saul was chosen king, Scripture was broken because of a prophecy in the book of Genesis declaring that Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah. And the Jews back then were told that the king would come from a certain line. Now, you guys, again, these are Bible, these, these, but some of you guys are, are new to Scripture. I know I'm, I'm shooting a little over here, but stay with me. The Jews mourned and fell away from God because they thought the king that was given to the nation of Israel was a sign that Messiah was not going to come. With this change of kingdoms, the kingdom was now given the proper lineage and the Jews could again rejoice if they were watching. The same Jews who, if they were watching, would have seen when the Lord Jesus entered the, temp the temple, just as predicted by the book of Daniel. However, that's why the Lord tells us, watch, pray, watch, pray, be ready, for God is coming at a day that you don't know. Don't let him come as a thief in the night. Watch, pray, be ready, for your Lord will come at an hour that you don't expect. Same thing he did with the Jews. Here he anoints this guy king. And I'm going to give you a little hint. David isn't going to take, the, he's not going to sit on the kingdom for 10 years. But watch what happens. Again, you that's new to scripture, listen what happens here. Phil again, we're going to read the latter part of verse 1. Fill your horn with oil and go, I'm sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he'll kill me. But the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Then invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. Samuel says, if Saul finds out that I'm going to anoint somebody else king, he's going to kill me. Which is a really good indicator that Saul has really gone off the deep end. I mean, Samuel is the one that anointed him. Samuel is the one that found him. Sam so for Saul to be that far that Samuel's word that he's going to kill him, there's got to be more going on in Samuel's brain than we understand. However, 
he says, okay, don't tell him what you're going there for. I want you to go do a sacrifice. And this is an interesting thing. Some scholars will disagree. Well, well, did God just tell him to lie? No, God told him to be wise. The Lord Jesus himself said, be wise as a serpent and gentle as a dove. The Bible says that a fool vents his feelings and a wise man holds them back. Don't let everybody know what you're thinking all the time just because it's the truth. In the street, they call that keeping it real. I'm just keeping it real. I got a better idea. Why don't you shut up, huh? (laughs) I'm just keeping it real. Don't keep it real, because every time you keep it real, you're letting everybody know what you think, and you've just lost your ability to be wise. I love this Chinese proverb. It's better to be silent and thought of a fool than to open your mouth and remove all the doubt. Verse 4, so Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? Now let me tell you what that's about. He walks into the city. Now, anybody you guys see, uh, any of you guys watch Little House on the Prairie when they were younger? Keep something in mind. In this day and age, this is what Little House on the Prairie, this, they lived in these little tiny towns and villages. You had to cross over woods and little trails and usually there were marauders and, and guys that were really trying. So you get to the next town and there these people had settled there and then you get to the next and some cities were big cities and some were little. So here they go to the next city and they find out it's Samuel. And Saul, again, he's off the deep end. And some towns that didn't show up to fight when he called them because he was recruiting, he went there and he wiped the whole town, the whole village out. So they, they saw Samuel, and they're like, oh, Samuel's here, Samuel's here, Samuel, Samuel's here, Samuel's here. Oh, man, we're in trouble, because I know a lot of people didn't show up the last battle, and we're supposed to show up. And they, they, all the elders of the city, they come out, and they go, um, are you here in peace? And he said, verse 5, peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons, and invite him to the sacrifice. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. Give me your attention. This wise man who hears God's voice so clearly, this man who all his life has served God, this is, like a, this is like a greater than a Billy Graham. Samuel had walked with the Lord now, some say 50 plus years, never had a scandal. I mean, this guy was, and all of a sudden Eliab, one of Jesse's sons comes, and they see Eliab was tall and handsome and long hair. And as soon as he walks in the room, Samuel looks at him and goes, Surely the Lord's anointed. There he is. Looks like a king, man. There he is. There's the king. There's the next king. There he is. I found him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. Ready, guys? One of the best verses in the entire Bible. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Bible says in in the New Testament that God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, the weak things to to confound the strong. You look at yourself in the mirror and you see what the world sees based upon the Grammy Awards, the American Idol, the, and, you, and you look and you say, oh, there's the next rock star. There's the next this. There's the next that. And the Lord says, you look at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. I can use you to change the world. I can use you to change the city. I can use you to change your job. I can use you to change your family just the way you are. You don't need to be tall. You don't need to be handsome. You don't need to have nice hair. You don't even have to have nice shoes. Sorry, ladies. I love that verse. I'm going to read it again. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Again, here's a man that heard God's voice so clearly. What happened? What happened? In Italian, we have a word. What are you, stunads? What are you, stunad? <laughs> Listen to God. What are you doing? Well, he looks like a king. God just told you to come to a town. God just told you to sacrifice. God just told you where to go. God just told you who to see. And you're so stunad all of a sudden just because the guy looks good? Ladies, you're so stunad because the guy looks good? 
That one was free. That was totally separate from the Bible study. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Samuel made Shema pass by, and he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all these the young men here? Then he said, well, there remains yet the youngest, but he's out there keeping the sheep. Now give me your attention. We have something in my house. I have a backyard. In Florida, I know that's rare, but I have a backyard, and it's fenced in. My kids, when they were young, we used to have something called, you ready? Poop patrol. Because we've always had dogs. And it's usually the youngest one who can, who has, I mean, we have them in all ages. You had to be like seven or eight at least, you couldn't send a three or that, to go to poop patrol. Because we always have dogs and they poop. And they, kids don't walk the dogs, they just let them in the backyard. So what they do is they, they have a, a garbage can that they drag around and a little tiny rake with three, three claws on it. Poop patrol. Let me let you on a little secret. Keeping the sheep in that time, poop patrol. That's why Samuel was out there doing that. He's the youngest one. Some say he was 12, 13, maybe even 14 years old. He was on poop patrol. Watch the sheep. Take them into that field. Take them into that field. Just make sure they're... Out. Can you keep count of the sheep? Can David keep count of the sheep? You with me? Verse, the latter part of verse 11, I guess. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Ruddy. I love that word, ruddy. Ruddy. Anybody here ever been described as ruddy? I had to look it up. What does ruddy mean? He had poop all over him. He was kind of just, a, he was an outside poop patrol guy. You know, he had pieces of, of wool stuck in his hair, and, you know, he had long hair and big eyes, just like a kid out there wrestling around with the sheep. There he was. He was ruddy. David! Your dad, come here. Comes running in, probably getting poop all on the house, coming in the house. Uh, what's up? Ruddy, bright eyes, good looking. You ever see a kid like that? Just, it's a great description. And David, Samuel looks at him and goes, that's him. Jesse's like, him? Samuel said to Jesse, send, and I'm sorry, where we go? Um, 13, 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose and went to Ramah. Give me your attention again. This is why you guys, a lot of you guys that are new to church, especially some of you guys are new to uh, even Calvary chapels, we anoint with oil. Oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. You'll see all of our elders, deacons, pastors, we all usually carry jars of oil. We see somebody that needs a anoint- Man, I'm out of oil. No, I got some. Carry a jar, put a little oil on them. Why? It's a picture of the Holy Spirit. And there's nothing special about it. It could be Crisco, Wesson, olive. You know, we, we, we get special oil. It smells nice. And, you know, it has a little emotional impact there when you put it on. But when you're anointing with oil, especially somebody who believes that the oil is a picture, here's what we're doing. We anointed Dorothy with oil. We said, power of the Holy Spirit come upon her. Now, in the old days, they anointed with oil. They, they, they anointed with oil. He had a horn, a goat's horn or a ram's horn filled with oil. And he said, okay, there he is. And he poured it on top of his head. Now, right now, to us, that's, that sounds lovely. Listen, back then, it was the greatest thing in the world because they didn't have showers back then. And it was hot, and it was sandy, and it was dirty, and there was no relief from it. It's not like, man, i got to go inside where the air conditioner and the fans are. It didn't work like that. What they would do is they would take oil, and they'd pour it on their hair. They'd slick their hair back. They'd take the, hand, the oil that was on their hand. They'd wipe it on their face, and they'd stand, washing all the dirt, washing all of the sand off, and they'd stand in the, in the, in the, uh, the wind, and it would blow on them. You, know, you, know, you ever had the wind blow on you when you're wet? That's nice. That's nice. That's what they did. 
And it said the Spirit of the Lord was upon him from that day forward. Verse 14, now here's where it gets really crazy. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp, and it shall be that he will play it with his hand when the distressing spirit from God is upon you, and you shall be well. Please give me your attention. Focus in. We're getting a weird stretch, a, re a weird turn here. Try to listen to me. When you sense the spirit, when you've prayed a lot, the strangest little thing happens. You get in a prayer circle, you pray over somebody, you sense everything that's going on in that, in the, in that little circle. I've prayed in so many different states with so many different Christians, and the spirit of unity is, is familiar to me as a glass of ginger ale, which I love. When you're praying, it could be five, ten, it could be people you don't know, and you're getting that prayer, and you say, Father God, and you start to call out the name of God, the spirit of unity sometimes just falls on you. Yes, behold how good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity, the Bible says. But every once in a while, there's somebody in your prayer circle, you might be praying for somebody, and it's just like, wow, there is a weird spirit that checked my spirit. That was strange. I get a weird, what the world says, a weird vibe from that. I get a weird vibe from that person. That person's got a weird vibe about them. You following me? A distressing spirit would come upon him. He didn't know what it was, but I know what it is. It was the rejection of the Holy Spirit. He had been told by God to do a number of things that he didn't do. He had taken, ready? I was told years ago, as a young man in Christ, there's three things that you don't mess with. The three G's. The gold, the girls, or the glory. Don't touch them. Don't go near them. Stay away from them. Surely death awaits those men who would touch the gold, touch the girls, or touch the glory. And we've watched over the last three chapters, Saul not just touch the gold, but apprehend the gold. Apprehend the girls. And for sure, more than anything else, steal the glory. And he was fitting because of it. It's that spirit that comes upon you when the spirit is saying, repent. You've done something horrible. No. And you, you fidget and you fuss. Repent. The spirit's saying, come on. Get it off you. And you can only reject it so long before now it becomes a distressing spirit upon you. You're just uneasy all the time and it's a matter you've been filled with the Holy Spirit and you have ready grieved the Holy Spirit the lights are broken sorry guys I gotta fix the switch do something with those because it's freaking people out I'm talking about the Holy Spirit and those things are flickering <laughs> that's electricity that's not the Holy Spirit sorry you guys thought I had some power I could have played that up right I don't go near the glory guys I'm afraid anything that happened to me would happen to Saul and many men I know Watch as I'm talking. The, the lights will flick. <laughs> flick the lights, quick. Flick the lights. Flick the lights. Did you see it? <laughs> the craziest thing can happen. They said, you know what we need to do? We need to get somebody who can play sweet music to soothe him. It was written, and I don't remember the man who wrote it. You can look me up later and tell me. Music hath charm to soothe the savage breast. The more you are uptight, the more there is a fit in you, music will soothe you. But it stands to reason. Now, I know you guys that have watched Bugs Bunny too much think that it soothed the savage beast. It's not. The, the, the actual poem was soothe the savage breast. Because it's in the heart of man. It's in the restlessness of his heart that these confusions occur. And I am going to do what most of you don't want me to do. I'm going to tell you, when you get serious with the things of the Lord, if you don't want that distressing spirit, my suggestion to you is to leave the music behind that does not glorify God. Because music, the same way it will soothe you, 
will destroy you. You want proof? You notice how all the people that listen to the same type of music speak the same way? You ever talk to somebody who listens to nothing but country music? They talk, they all talk. Wait a second, aren't you from the city, dude? Living that country music, though, man. Y'all got the crazy ways about you. And you meet the person's parents, and you're like, Hi, how are you? So nice to meet you. Or, listen, I'm from New York, and when we you talk like this, all right? Especially where I'm from is Queens. It's right next to Brooklyn. This is how we talk. Yo, what's up? How's it going? Well, forget about it. Forget about it for you, too. And then I have friends that, like, went to the dark side and started listening to country music, and then all of a sudden they started talking a little bit like that. Black folk, white folk, Hispanic folk, talking like this. Wow. How did it? That music, every music has a spirit. Let me tell you something. In case you didn't know this, and you can look it up for homework, look up Isaiah 12, Ezekiel 38. It is where the history of, of Satan the devil. The Bible says that Lucifer was the anointed cherub who covers. He was the worship leader, that he played pipes. He was a piano player, pipes and timbrels. He led the worship. And that one day, the Bible says that iniquity was found in him. That one day, as he was leading worship, he was leading the angels in worship to God, he said, why are they worshiping him? I'm the one playing the piano. I'm the one that they should be worshiping. I should be the one sitting on the most high. I should be the one that, I, 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 Isaiah chapter 12 and 14, I, 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 I. And he was cast out of heaven. But don't ever think that the tool of the enemy still is in the origin of his beginnings. I've heard, I've said this before and you guys are sick of hearing it. You, you meet a white kid from Boca Raton, and he's got, yeah, dog, it's great, man. It's always over. Did you grow up in Chicago? It's great, dog, man. It's cool. We all cool, you know what I mean? Chill. You don't meet my dog. What's up, man? And you're like, Tupac Shacker, your daddy or something like that. I don't get it. It's the spirit that comes with it. It's real, guys. It's not, they ain't faking it. It's real. That spirit has subdued them. You guys verse also heard me say this, and this is what I'm going to do the last thing I'm going to say. When I was growing up, when I was in high school in the early 80s, I was addicted to a music by a band called Pink Floyd. And in 1980, a, 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 an album called The Wall came out. And I thought this was the greatest music I ever listened to. But here's the craziest thing. All through high school, I was diagnosed manic-depressed, very violent, extremes of fit and wrath. And I don't know why. Yeah, I do know why. Because all I did is nurse myself on the wall, which had the music was either completely manic depressive or completely off of the chain. And that's what I want. So you thought you might like to go to the show. 30 years, I still remember every word of the album. Haven't listened to it in over 25 years. And I can tell you every word. Of, somehow, I can't remember my wife's cell phone number. <laughs> I got to, I, I, what's your number? I, I, I got to look it up. It's got speed dial. But I can remember every song off of that. Be careful, Christian. You want to get serious about the things of the Lord and you want, don't want that distressing spirit on you? Turn it off. Throw it out. Listen, we had, a, we had a party. When I was in 1997, I had gotten out of prison, serious about the things of the Lord, and a buddy of mine told me the same thing I'm telling you. And I was a musician. And I stacked up 150 plus CDs and I sat at behind a dumpster, right behind my store, and there was a big green dumpster, and I lamented the black crows, <laughs> Frank Zappa, <laughs> the doors. No, no, no. Threw them all out, and like a chain, each one, God bolt cuttering me off free. I would walk out free. I remember waking up in the morning, Come, Jesus, come. 
for your children come ye. I was like, wow. I woke up in the morning singing a Christian song. I remember the most powerful feeling. It felt so good. Instead of singing, getting up singing, Vera, Vera, what has become of you? Young brothers in here are like, huh? Okay, I got my mind on my money and my money on my money. Yeah, now you're with me, right? Yeah, I'm with you. Believe me, I know. Continuing, verse 17. So Saul said to his servants, Provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the servants answered and said, Look, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person. And the Lord is with him. Please give me your attention. This is what's called a divine setup. It's crazy how he gets anointed king, and what does God do? Oh, wait a second. I know a kid. Man, the kid's phenomenal. You've got to see him out in the field. He's like a little guy of war. He's got his tune. He's shooting the bears off and chasing away the sheep. He's keeping the sheep. To... Man, this kid's great. And I hear him play the harp out there. Where'd you hear him? You're in Beth. You're 100 miles away. I don't know, man. It's just a weird thing I happen to be going through. Weird thing, huh? Let me tell you, we call that in the world coincidence. We call that in the church god instance. Something like that. god wins. When God wants you to be somewhere and to have something, guys, please understand, you don't got to force it. God will do it. This is so perfect also for you ladies and, and men that are single. Listen. If God wants the man for you, the woman for you that he's chosen, you don't got to go looking for him. Christian mingle, don't need it. Don't need it. Don't need it. I love their commercials, though. Do you want to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ with the mate of your dreams? (laughs) No, I was hoping to be alone the rest of my life with a miserable Satan worshiper. And the married lady's like, yes, I am. I'm stuck at home with my miserable Satan worshiper. <laughs> On top of all that, he's good looking. Therefore, Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son David, who is with the sheep. Could you imagine? You want to talk about trust? Jesse, that's his little boy. That's his youngest son. Samuel comes and anoints him. And then all of a sudden, literally, we don't know how long, how many years, how many months later it was, he gets a call from the king. Hey, the king wants to see your son. I mean, he, he had to flip out. He's going to kill him, of course. He knows. He knows what David did, and he's dead. He had to trust. Guys, so much, so much for us. Me and my wife love our children way too much, especially our new little ones. The four-year-old and the six-year-old, we fought so hard to keep them. There was so much that kept us so much that was difficult in, you need her? You need her? Whose little baby girl is that? She looks like she's having a, a tough night. She just wants to see her mommy. Okay, mommy's still here. She didn't abandon you. <laughs> Hi. You're safe. It's okay. So, what was I saying? Yes, I remember now. Thank you. Me and my wife had fought so hard for our kids. We took them out of the foster care system and had to fight with the government, literally fight with the government to keep them. And now so every day, whatever happens with them, is so difficult to let them go. We're so afraid of what's going to happen. And there's a certain amount of trust that has to exist in our hearts and our minds. Even like that little thing right there. Look at her. I mean, what perfect timing. She has to trust. She's in God's hands. Now, she's got a mess of kids, so, like, you guys know the first one, you, like, don't let his feet touch the ground. By the fourth one, you're like, just wash the glass away. She'll be fine. (laughs) But there's a certain amount of trust you have to have. Parents, listen to me. Look at this guy. Could you imagine? Man, there's a lot of messages going on tonight, right? I just, there's so much here. Love the Word of God. I love the Word of God. Verse 20, here's where we close. And Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat, and sent them by his son David to Saul. 
So David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. Then Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Please let David stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. And so it was, whenever the Spirit of, from God was upon Saul, that David would take a harp and play it well with his hand. Then Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. Here's where we close. last part of the message is this. For you that are like me, that have struggled with anger. You've been shown anger your whole life. I'm from an Italian Sicilian family. We are, we throw, when we lose it, we lose it. Holes in the wall, smashing cars, we lose it. If you've come to Christ and you find yourself wondering how I'm going to overcome this, you know, I really hope that as a Christian I would overcome this. Anger subsides slowly. Even 20 years later, there's so much inside, there's so much rage that lives in my memory. There's so much rage that lives in my experience that you want to flip your crap, you know, as the world says. The Bible says that a fool will vent his emotions. Anger is like a snake. In case you guys don't know about reptiles, reptiles only grow as big as you feed them. Anger is a snake, literally the serpent. You feed it, it grows. When I sit down with a woman, she tells me, she comes to church or something, she has a black eye or something like that, and, and I go, what happened? We were drinking, he got mad, he did it by accident. And I go, uh-uh-uh, you call the police right now. And they go, no, they'll arrest him, he'll get in trouble. And I'll go, listen to me, this ain't going to get better. You're in trouble. This gets worse and worse and worse. You're going to wind up in the hospital, on life support, or dead. You call the police now, and you put an end to this now. You change the locks. You get him out until he seeks help. And the husband calls, how do you tell my wife? And I go, how do you hit your wife? I thought you were a pastor. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll just sit back while you beat the woman. Great. You got the wrong church. Because I'll come to that house, and I'll throw you out of your own house. And they go, what? Uh, you call yourself a pastor. And usually what happens within a week, the woman leaves the church and they say, wow, that pastor's crazy. That guy's the nut job. He's the MMA fighter crazy guy. Yeah, 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 that's what I am. I'm crazy because I protect your wife from you. Sorry. <laughs> it's, an, it's a snake. And the more you feed it, the bigger it gets and the worse it gets. You cut this off now. And here's how it gets cut off. Worship. Worship. You come to church, or let me tell you, get rid of that music, and you get yourself some Hillsong, you get yourself some Rita Springer, you get, you get yourself some worship. I'm not talking about music by Christians. I'm talking about Christian worship music. And you set apart every single day a good 20 to 30 minutes for you, just you and God, to worship. And you sing back and forth, and you just play it in your ears like you did the old music. And you're going to find the importance of music has a greater value than you even thought. Some people, especially kids nowadays, music's their thing. Man, they hear a song, oh, that's my jam. Turn it up, turn it up. Man, music's important to you. Oh, man, mu it's kind of like my thing. Music's my thing, you know. Music, I'm a music. You guys know what I'm talking about? Until you become a Christian, you abandon your music and then you receive the new music, the anointed music, and then you find how much more important it is than you ever thought it was. You were right, music's important, but way more important than you thought, way more powerful than you thought. And you start filling your heart up with this better, this worship, and you spend some time every day, and you watch that anger subside, subside, subside. And, and then here's the end of the story. You start to become a peaceful person. Believe it or not, some people in the world that know me they think I'm like the calmest person in the world. Man, you're just so chill. You're so peaceful. It's like, <laughs> no, 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 no. You just caught me. I was just worshiping. <laughs> Give me about 15 minutes. Believe me, I'll be pretty high strung. <laughs> but the peace of God is upon me because I worship God, really worship God. And I don't let 
listen, if I'm in a, if I, if I'm in a store and they got some old music playing on there, some old songs. I enjoy it. Hey, I remember. I, I'll say to my wife, honey, you remember that song? Yeah. That one tune I always like listening to. You got to get right back to where it started from. Love is good. Love. You ain't got that video, do you? Bro, you ain't got that video camera on, do you? You don't, you don't have that on, do you? Oh. <laughs> mm. But I leave there and I leave the music behind. I don't go, man, I got to go buy that album. I got to go get that. Oh, man, remember that? I got to go, I got to go find that. You know, I got to put that on Pandora or something like that. No, don't do that. Enjoy it. Don't be afraid of it because now that the spirit of living God is upon you, that stuff can't come near you. You don't have to be afraid of it. You're stronger than it now. It no longer has you captive. Oh, yeah, but whenever I hear it, I can't turn it off. And listen, then it still has you captive and you need to turn it off more than ever. Music is as powerful as any drug you ever had. Any, any, any drug you ever had. Let me tell you something. Tell a kid he can't listen to his music, he'll lie, beg, steal. You, he'll, he'll run away just so he can listen to his music, just like a drug he will do. Get a hold of that stuff. Again, last thing. Um, we're going to start to see what God can do when he takes a man's heart. When a man's right, when a man's heart is right with God, David, the Bible says, had a heart after God. If you guys are, are, are into interesting facts about the Bible, David wrote the majority of the Psalms. David knew about heartbreak. If you've never read Psalm 51, Psalm 52, uh, if you've never read Psalm 91, he who dwells in the secret place, if you've never read, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not. That's the same David. Next week, we're going to have a prayer meeting. But the week after that, he's going to kill a giant named Goliath. Oh, you know, I don't care who you are, you know about David that killed Goliath, who later becomes the greatest king of all time, who is the predecessor to the greatest spiritual king that we've been waiting for our whole lives. He's his great, 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 grandson. Close your Bible. If you're new to church and you're wondering, what do I do now? Do what God tells you to do. It's that simple. Oh, but you said so much, and there's so much in my life. Listen to me. Don't force it. As you leave here, God's going to knock on your heart, and he's going to leave something in there that he wants to stick. I took this bucket of pure Holy Spirit oil, and I just threw it all over everybody. And so many of you guys are like, oh, that hurts. Oh, the music. Oh, the anger. Oh, you got me everywhere today, man. I'm horrible. Yeah, yeah, we're all horrible. Believe me. Just let God, just pray when you leave here and say, God, what do you want me to change? What, what is it? God will knock and he'll go, here's, here's what me and you got to do next, together. And I'll give you the strength and the power to do it. Don't condemn yourself. Don't go, okay, well, let's leave. Well, first I'm going to go home is throw out the radio. and then I'm gonna, you know, Let God do it. I'll knock on your heart. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of your word and the instruction of your word. Thank you for your spirit which leads and guides us. And God, for that person that might be sitting here that has never begun a relationship with you, God, I pray that tonight is the night that they consider the cross and they look to you and they receive you in their heart without a personal proclamation in front of a bunch of people, just in them with you. May they just receive you, God. May they just look to the cross and place it on the empty part of their heart and receive your spirit. And God, for them that are here that are so excited that your word had so much to say, may they know that it was not my words, but your words. The word of God makes the simple wise. Thank you, God.